This video is about the Wendat Nation, but before we begin, we must acknowledge that there are many names for the Wendats, such as Wendat, Wendatia, the Hurons, and more. For this presentation, we will be using Wendat, but if one is talking to somebody from the Wendat Nation, they should ask them what they prefer to be called. After all, it is their culture. In this presentation, we will guide you through the creation story and how that affected the Wendat society. Then move on to more detailed aspects of the Wendat society pre-contact. Finally, we will address the land movements of the Wendat before contact, and then we'll also address the land dispossession that occurred during contact. Let's begin with the Wendat creation story. The origins of the Wendat derive from the creation story known as the Legend of Sky Woman. Sky Woman, also known as Atensik, fell from her home in the clouds at a time when the world was a vast ocean only inhabited by sea animals, whom all gathered into a council to witness the falling of this woman. They all agreed to save her life in creating a landmass on the back of a giant turtle. This initiative was led by Toad by obtaining mud from the ocean to place it on the turtle's back. Once Sky Woman reached them, Wild Geese cushioned her fall and took her to her new home. The Wendat were descendants of Atensik and structured their society based on the principles that emerge from this creation story. For instance, Toad represents the role of leaders, Atensik represents women, and the council represents communal systems of power. The origins of the Wendat's location derives from Wendiki, meaning where Wendats live. They were situated from a vast area between Georgian Bay and Lake Simcoe. Furthermore, the word Wendat was used to describe the Confederate nations of Wendiki. There were sought to be four to five Confederate nations, including the Nation of the Rock, the Bear Nation, the People of the Cord Nation, the people of the Deer Nation, and the people of the Marsh Nation. The organization of the Wendat social structure embodies a circular society known as the Great Sacred Circle of Life. The circle consisted of 11 sub-circles, including self, family, lineage, clan, village, nation, and confederacy, as well as the extended confederacy, the continent, the world, and the universe. They regarded the universe as a great chain of relationships linking an infinity of beings in one great family. Everything within the society was regarded as an expression of a single great will that is the source of life and change. Therefore, each entity, whether that be a man or a woman, animals or vegetation within the universe, were free and equal. In order to conform to the circle, humans were required to all be equal and interdependent in order to unite relationships. This was achieved through an extension of kinships of clans as they would link communities and nations in a form of kinship, even when actual blood ties were absent. The clan was matrilineal, meaning that kinship and membership was determined through the female line, and matrilocal, meaning that the family lived in a longhouse of the woman. Each nation's village was organized by a matrilineal clan, including but not limited to Big Turtle, Little Turtle, Mud Turtle, Wolf, Bear, Beaver, Deer, Porcupine, Striped Turtle, Highland Turtle, Snake, and Hawk, as well as Fox, Sturgeon, and Loon. Their government consisted of four levels, including lineage, the village, the nation, and the confederacy. The lineage was a segment of a clan within a village that consisted of approximately 250 to 300 members and matrilineages. The chief of each lineage were chosen by lineage members, and in particular the older women of the lineage based on intelligence, oratorical skill, willingness to work, popularity, and above all, courage. The woman could dismiss an unsatisfactory candidate. Politics remained a predominantly local affair, with decisions reflecting village-level interests, whereby village representatives frequently came together for general meetings of their nations and would delegate matters to the Confederacy once a year. 
The Confederacy Council was considered the highest level within their government system. The council would meet to discuss affairs surrounding political developments, trade, village resettlement and subdivision, new substance strategies, diplomatic missions, important feasts, major expeditions, the development of new routes, and to reinforce the nations together. Trade and Allies The Wendat had closed trading, political and social relations with the Petun, Ottawa, Nipissing, and the Algonquin nations of Georgian Bay and the Ottawa Valley. With these nations, the Wendat traded corn, beans, and cord, which was made up of Indian hemp. They also traded tobacco and items such as native copper, catlinite, seashells, and wampum. The Wendat joined an alliance of military and trade alliance that the Innu and Algonquin formed with the French by participating in an attack against the Mohawk which was a member of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. For this video, we start at 300 AD in the Middle Woodland period. At this time, there are groups of hunter-gatherers that are located in Ontario. This is, group is typically called Point Peninsula. In 500 AD, we start to see some aspects of early Iroquoian society emerge, such as the development of maize agriculture. This group of hunter-gatherers stay in this area until around 800 AD. It is then that they start to expand and explore further into Ontario. The descendants of these hunter-gatherers were called Pickering, which started to develop societal traits that can be seen in the Wendats at the point of contact. The Pickering phase starts around 970 AD, with the movement up to the east end of Lake Ontario. And due to maize agriculture, their population grew steadily over the next 360 years. Around 1300 to 1330, we see a transition from the Pickering phase to the Urian phase, which was marked by new pottery and further growth into Ontario. The Urian phase is then followed by the Middleport phase around 1330 to 1420, which is marked by a great growth in population, which of course is followed by rapid cultural changes. This is a point where we see the developing of a more complex social political units such as clans. Finally, before first contact, there is the late pre-contact period, which is around 1450. This is where we see the final developments of the Wendat society, which would have been in place at the point of contact, such as evidence of a matriarchal and matriolocal society. Because of extensive trading networks, it is believed that the Wendat nation were aware of the Europeans within North America, but it isn't until June of 1609 when the French first meet with the Wendats. A year after so-called first contact in June 1609, the French made a peace treaty with the Wendats, which at this point they had nicknamed the Huron Nation. The treaty coincided with three major battles fought by the Wendat, which were in the years 1609, 1610, and 1615. These battles were between the Wendats and their allies against the Iroquois Confederacy, but mainly the Haudenosaunee and the Onagada. The allies of the Wendats were the Putin Nation, the Algonquin Nation from the Ottawa region, the French, and the Montaganas. The allyship with the French did not last, and the peace treaty was not renewed. In consequence to this, we see in the years 1642 to 1646, the Haudenosaunee nation defeated the Algonquins from the Ottawa Valley. Then in 1648 to 1649, the Haudenosaunee defeat the Wendats. And then in 1649 to 1650, the Haudenosaunee also defeated the Putin. In 1648 to 1649, after the defeat, the Wendats were dispersed from their homeland. The Deer Nation and the Rock Nation joined the Haudenosaunee near Seneca. Some scholars refer to them as the traditional faction. Other Wendats fled with the Jesuits to Christian Island in Georgian Bay. Scholars refer to them as the Christian faction. And the rest of the Wendats fled to Pusin until they were also defeated by the Haudenosaunee. 
This group was referred to by scholars as the traditional anti-Iroquoian faction. In 1651, with increasing pressures, the Christian faction made the move from Christian Island to Ile de Laurent. At this time, they are joined mostly by the Bear Nation and some of the Rock Nation and some of the Cord Nation. In the peace negotiations of 1652 to 1657 between the Haudenosaunee and the French, the rest of the Bear and the Cord Nations join this faction. At this point in time, they also make the move from Ile de Laurence to Sicily, then to their current location in Lauriette in Quebec. The remaining Wendat in Ontario were co coerced by the French to join the Haudenosaunee Nation. The rest of the Rock Clan went to the Onondaga Nation, and the remaining of the Bear Clan went to the Mohawks. Returning to the traditional anti-Iroquoian faction, which are now known as the Wendat or Wendate, this group made the trek to Green Bay in the 1650s, and were joined along the way by some of the Algonquins from Ottawa. Together, these groups were pushed to the Mississippi region. In 1671, this group was attacked by the Dakota Sioux of that region, which ultimately led them to Miklonomachia. Around 1704, the Wendat and the Ottawa Nation settled near Detroit, but in 1738, there was a split between the group, creating two other factions. This fracture is thought to be due to a disagreement between the Ottawa Nation and the French. One faction of the Wendats near Detroit stayed across the river from the city, and the others moved to Sandusky. In 1756 to 1763, the Detroit faction fought for the French in the Seven Year War. But after the French were defeated, they joined the Pontiacs against the French. The descendants of, of the Detroit faction can be found in the Windsor area today. Returning to the Sandusky faction in 1748, they were forced into the Ohio Valley and then were forced to cede their lands to the Americans after the revolution in 1776. Then they were forcibly removed to Kansas by the Indian Removal Act in the 1830s, which was passed by Congress. They were then again forcibly removed in 1867 from Kansas to Oklahoma with the Seneca Nation due to the Kansas-Nebraska Act. This history of colonization through dispossession has led the Wendat Nation to have descendants in Quebec, Ontario, Ohio, Kansas, Oklahoma, and the Windsor areas. The forcible removals and the fractures of the Wendat Nation has led each community to develop a unique but similar culture. Each group experiences their own form of colonization while still maintaining their culture to this day. Now that we have led you through the creation story and how it came to form Wendat culture, then through the pre-contact Wendat society, and finally we address their land movements before and after contact, it is time to acknowledge how our society has oppressed, hindered, and tried to destroy a rich and vibrant culture through land dispossession. People today are beginning to learn about how we as settlers have tried to assimilate the vibrant indigenous cultures here in Canada through things like the Indian Act, residential schools, the past system, and many other oppressive acts. But one thing people don't often acknowledge is the act of colonialism through land of dispossession. We as settlers keep taking the land in which the Wendat people were living on, which constantly made them move to new areas, and each new move left pockets of people behind. These pockets of people still retain the Wendat culture, but since there is so few of them, scholars typically deny their existence, or even worse, deny their identity altogether by stating that their Wendat culture is no longer prevalent in that region. Despite this, the Wendat people are still, st are still starting... <laughs> Despite this, the Wendat people are starting to thrive again and recoalesce into a Wendat confederation that has official communities in Quebec, Ohio, Oklahoma, and Kansas. In the end, the Wendat nation has survived our settler colonialism and has the resilience to maintain their culture through cultural genocide by Canada and the United States. We must acknowledge their thriving communities and give them the safe spaces needed to repair the damage our ancestors had done on their culture. 
This can be through condemning, condemning past atrocities, through learning about their culture and acknowledging their traditional ancestral lands, and through decolonizing the spaces we possess, such as our home, our workplace, and our communities. What will you do today?